Albert Einstein, Richard Branson, Bill Gates, John F. Kennedy, Tony Robbins, Michael Phelps, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of industries. What else do they have in common? Well, they all have ADHD, but you don't hear much about that, do you? You know what you hear even less about? The successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smart Ass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm an attorney, not a doctor, a lifelong student, not a coach. I'm also the creator of Cortography, a patent pending system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your superpowers, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest superpowers. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Otsuka, and I wanted to welcome you to episode number 71 of ADHD for Smart Ass Women. In this episode, I am going to introduce you to Dr. Kirsten Milligan. Milligan! <laughs> I didn't get the first name right, I'd get the last name wrong. Dr. Milliken is a licensed clinical psychologist, an ADHD coach, and the author of Play DHD, Permission to Play, a Prescription for Adults with ADHD. She lives in Portland, Maine with her two amazing children, her partner, Perry, and her two dogs. As a licensed clinical psychologist, Kirsten has worked in a variety of fields, including juvenile justice, geriatric mental health, school psychology, community mental health, and nonprofit development. Currently, Kirsten has a private practice where she offers services to military veterans, provides diagnostic evaluations, and coaches teens and adults with ADHD. Welcome, Kirsten. Did I get it right? You got it right with one little blip in my last name, but that's okay. We over-rehearsed my first name. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Uh, And then when it's spelled a certain way, but it sounds, well, you know, ADHD. I know, all my life. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. So before we go into your book, before we go into your practice and your fabulous World Without ADHD project, can we start at the beginning? Can we start with your own diagnoses? Because you're one of us, right? I am one of you. <laughs> and you're one of me. So. <laughs> yes, exactly. We are in the same tribe. And I knew I would love you because of all the play. (laughs) Yes. What not to love, right? When you say ADHD, most people, their ears perk up. But when you say ADHD and play, like if there's any stragglers, they join in too. They jump on board. Okay. So I want to tell the listeners, this is something really funny to me that happened this morning. So um, we were going back and forth with emails and all of a sudden in one of the emails, and I don't know if this is at the bottom of all your emails, but it's now going to be at the bottom of mine because it totally worked. So at the bottom of her email, it says, earn points for responding to this email. Three points for responding in zero to six hours of receipt. Two points for seven to 24 hours. One point for 25 to 48 hours response. Now, normally, Kirsten, especially right before I'm going on, you know, to record a podcast, I would have seen your message and I would have just left it. But because I took that as a challenge. I had to respond. Is that what your experience has been with it? That's exactly it. Everybody, you know, and nobody really cares what the points are for, which is so fabulous. (laughs) But yeah, for most of us, you know, if there's a challenge game on. So yeah. Oh my gosh. That so works. And I hope I can steal it because I love it. Anything you want. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So tell me when were you diagnosed? I was diagnosed when I was 42 years old. No way. Way. And I have to say, like, in some ways, it's a little embarrassing because <laughs> I'm a psychologist. Yeah. And I was working, my, my niche had become working with people who had ADHD and other learning issues, you know, all age ranges. And everybody that got sent to me, the person who'd send them would say, you know, Kirsten just gets it. And I was like, okay, whatever. And when my younger son was about seven years old, he was diagnosed with ADHD. 
in a roundabout way. And after that happened, I was sitting home one night thinking to myself, ADHD is highly heritable. And I can tell you that there are a lot of people in my family on both sides that have it. But I knew his dad didn't have it. And so I kept thinking, well, maybe it's me. And when I all of a sudden put that together and started putting my own experiences over my lifetime in perspective, it kind of made sense. So this is so common, first of all. Your story and my story basically mirror each other. Our kid was diagnosed with it. And so this is my thing. It literally took me eight months researching ADHD for my son before I could even see it in me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, imagine working in the field with yeah. lots of people who have ADHD, and I just get it because, you know, because I'm just a great psychologist, I guess. <laughs> but really, it's I get it because I'd experienced it all, and I just never, like, put that together until yeah, Oliver got diagnosed. So, And did you get tripped up? Because, well, you sound to me like you're ADHD, that you're, you're, you're hyperactive or combined type, right? Or are you inattentive? I'm more inattentive, but one of the things that I always say is whether you show your hyperactivity outwardly or not, we all have that internal hyperactivity. Yes. And I think a lot of that is what makes me kind of, you know, get up and jump around and move around. But I wouldn't call myself predominantly hyperactive, more inattentive. So did you get tripped up with ever even thinking this might be you because you did so well in school? I'm assuming you did well in school. I mean, you're a doctor, right? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my story about getting through school. When I was in high school, in my mind, I was an A student. My father so generously sent me all of my report cards years later, and I found out that I was probably more like a B, B plus student. But probably working your rear end off for that, right? Working hard in some topics, but <laughs> in my senior year of high school, I took a psychology class and it was first thing in the morning. And I sometimes didn't make it to class and I wrote my own notes. So it was okay. And I did well on the tests and, you know, on the assignments. But at the end of the year, my psychology teacher said to me, Kirsten, whatever you do, don't go into psychology. <gasps> and right, that's a challenge. That's not a warning. That's a challenge. And so day one, I declared myself a psychology major and I never wavered. <laughs> so. Okay, but why did your psychology teacher tell you that? Because I would think that it sounds to me like psychology is really your area of interest. You know, I think it is, with some exceptions, I think the things that we excel at, show an interest in, are, you know, just really good at when we're in high school are not always the things that we end up pursuing later on or being really good at. And so while I think I was generally a lazy student in a lot of ways, you know, I don't know. It just, it worked out. Whether it was because she challenged me or because, you know, looking at people and how they think and why they do things and just trying to figure things out, puzzles, is really interesting to me. But in high school, I think high school psychology is so much different than real psychology. <laughs> so you know, we were just learning theories. We were memorizing information. And that's, that doesn't really grab my brain's attention. So, Yeah. So once you knew it was ADHD and you had the benefit of all this hindsight, what are some of the symptoms that you always wondered about? You know, why do I do this? Why am I like this? But you now recognize them as clearly ADHD. Well, obviously the big one is the emotional outbursts. So yeah, I could take it from one to 2000 in the blink of an eye when I was frustrated and it caused me a lot of problems. I think also, you know, when things are not interesting and engaging, feeling very distant and, and uninterested in things, um, not being able to follow through. I, one of my images of that is always, you know, we all rotated chores in my house. And when dishes were my turn, I always left one or two things in the sink. And it wasn't like I planned and said, you know, I'm going to leave one or two things in the sink. I would just like get down to the last few things and I would have some other thoughts going through my head and I would go to do them. And so it was just, there are a lot of things like that. 
the emotional one, I have to say, is probably the biggest one. And that's one that I took on for myself as a challenge to really try and and manage better once I knew what it was that was the trigger for that. I have to ask you this just because, you know, I have a psychologist here. And so I'm always thinking, okay, how does this, <laughs> how does this affect my life, right? Right. Have you always had a drivenness to you? If there's something that you're really interested in, you're just going to be way more interested than everybody else? Absolutely. All in. You know, it's it's all or nothing. Go big, go home. Um, <laughs> I say that all the time. <laughs> until I'm not interested and then I'm done. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I think when I got diagnosed and started explaining that to my mom, she all of a sudden went, oh, she said, now I get it. She said, because when you're done, you're done. Like there is nothing I could do to like get you back on task or bring you back to doing what I wanted or had asked you to do. And I'm like, yep, that's it. Did you always feel like you were different? Yeah. I mean, it was always never really quite fit in. Um, I just thought I was so awesome. Nobody else could keep up. (laughs) Well, and isn't that so funny? Because when I hear about, you know, social issues and not feeling like you fit in, yeah, I never felt like I fit in, but I didn't want to fit in. No. Like I... (laughs) No. So I can relate to what you're saying. Well, because the other people who I would have fit in with to me were so boring. I know. They were just, totally. I was like, why? Well, I don't want to be like that. <laughs> exactly. Oh my God. I, I just love that. Okay. So as a psychologist and a coach, you have focused on educating your clients on the value of play I as know. a naturopathic treatment for ADHD. So how did that come about? I was at the... ADCA, the ADD Coaching Academy, and we had to do... um, You're part of ADCA? I am. I didn't know that. I think that is the most amazing program. I'll tell you what, I met David Guerk a number of years ago, and I had asked Mm -hmm. him and Barbara, you know, I'm a psychologist. I've worked in this field. Do I really have to take all these classes to get my coaching? And yes, you do. And I'm glad I did because it was a great education. Amazing. But you know that you have to do a project, which is essentially like a graduation or a senior project when you get through advanced. Right. And I had been doing some research and I don't even know how it came up. Oh, I do know how it came up. Now, (laughs) rethinking this, you have to do a class around some of your personal stuff having to do with ADHD. And one of the exercises was to name a person who was important to you in every decade of your life. And then you have to tell what it was about them that made them important to you. And on all of mine, the theme was play. And so that became like this aha moment for me, that play was important to me. I happened to have a marketing genius who's also an ADHD tribe member who was in the office next to me. And I started talking about this and he said, oh, play DHD. (laughs) <laughs> well, duh. Yeah. So uh-huh. that became my thing. Um, I did some more research on it, you know, submitted some of that for my senior project or my advanced project, and then just started writing the book because it made sense to me. Like why there was like a couple of articles written about the connection between play and ADHD. And a couple of them were running rats through mazes. But it made sense that dopamine is created when we're doing things that are playful, right? It's the feel-good chemical. So if you're doing something that feels good, i.e. playing, you're creating that. The deficit in ADHD is dopamine. So those two to me just naturally made sense that they should go together. You know, you think about kids who are in school and they're being called the class clown and a lot of them are diagnosed with ADHD at some point. Well, of course they're they're clowning around. They're trying to engage their brains. They're trying to have fun. And sometimes that doesn't work so well in classrooms, but they're trying to engage in some form of self-management by playing. So that became my thing. And it is so much fun because the more you focus on play, of course, the happier your brain is, the more attentive and activated you feel. So when you're working with a client and you're trying to integrate play, I mean, I guess what you're trying to do is get them to understand that their brain functions best when they're in positive emotion, right? If they're in negative emotion, they can't move forward at all. And so you're tying positive emotion to play. Can you give us some ideas of how you go about doing that? Um, Well, 
I mean, first of all, you have to have self-awareness. So a lot of the beginning of coaching with any client has to do with just noticing, like, where are they successful? Where are they struggling? And it doesn't just have to do with activities. It has to do with time of day, who they're with, you know, um, diet, sleep, exercise, all of those things kind of tie into it because, of course, the better you're sleeping, the better you're eating, the better the people are around you, the easier it is to get into a good mood and to have fun. So looking at some of the habits and developing them to take advantage of the things that seem to spark (laughs) their interest. For some reason, the whole thing around spark joy just keeps coming up this week for me. Marie Kondo. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it's actually kind of fun. I think it's I think it's just silly, which makes it fun. So but you know, what sparks their joy? What gets them going? And it sometimes it's looking at things in a very different way than we normally think. So play doesn't have to be, you know, throwing a ball with your dog or being on a local softball league or anything that we typically think of as play. It can be having a conversation. It can be writing if you love writing, baking if you love baking. So whatever it is that really gets you going and the thing that you enjoy focusing on and don't want your attention to be taken away from. And then starting to observe what is it about those situations? What is it about you, the situation, the activity? that really is motivating to you and how can you capitalize on that in other areas where maybe it's harder to pay attention and feel motivated. So even the other day, I have a client of mine who, when she's not feeling very motivated, she actually likes going in and researching thoughts on procrastination, which (laughs) cracks me up. So yesterday she sent me a TED Talk on procrastination and I emailed back to her and I said, I've got a really busy day today, but I'm going to pin this in my inbox so that when I can take a break, I'm going to watch this so that I can have a little bit of humor during my day. So it'll be like a little reward for me. And uh, it was, it was great. So when I was feeling exhausted because I'd been doing so much work, I got to watch this awesome video and it got the dopamine going again. So the whole idea behind this is you are always looking for... You know, how do you take those mundane tasks or whatever it is that you need to get through and make them so they're more fun, they're more interesting? It's that, but it's also making sure that when people are planning their days, that they're purposely including activities that are fun and playful for them, that are rewarding for them. Because so often we build our schedules around the work and we don't leave time for fun. So, you know, we get burned out, we get exhausted. Whereas if we start building our time around having fun, being more engaged, enjoying our lives in different ways, whether it's during a five minute break in your day, or it's for two or three hours or more at a time, making sure to include those periods is is very important. How do you do that? I mean, my first thought (laughs) when I hear that is, Once I get myself going, I can't get myself out. So the last thing that I would do is build in. I mean, if I'm stuck, that's when I would build that in. Yes. Well, and oftentimes that's where we start Mm -hmm. is, you know, the obvious times when you're stuck, you want to pull away, things just aren't working and you're in discomfort. That's a great place to start because... Nobody wants to keep on going then. It's, it can be painful. But once you get into that habit and realizing that there is benefit to kind of shifting gears, it becomes easier to build those in during your day, whether it's during a transition from one activity to another or just breaking up longer tasks so that you've got periods during that task when you're maybe looking up and doing something different that feels good to your brain and your body. So your goal is even if they're in what we would call hyper-focus and they're totally intent on what they're doing and getting this work done, you're saying that it's best for them if they actually broke out of that every, I don't know, two hours or I'm not sure what the schedule is, that they're actually going to get more done or they're going to be more successful or they're going to feel better. Why are they doing this? I have a friend of mine, David Now 
who says, you know, for every hour of exercise, you get two hours of energy at the end of the day. And so I say the same kind of thing for play. For every, you know, hour of play, and most of us are doing shorter periods of that, but for every, you know, 10 or 15 minutes of play, you're getting 20 to 30 minutes of energy, motivation, attention, and focus back. So I think a lot of us get heads down when we're in the hard work, when we get hyper-focused on the hard stuff because we just want to get it over with. Yes. And those are the things that you probably want to break up more. There's also the hyper-focus where we're actually enjoying ourselves. We're really having a good time and we're hyper-focused because we want to stay engaged in that activity because it feels good and it's actually activating the dopamine system. So there's two different types of hyper-focus. Oh, I didn't even know that. I'm just talking about the second one because to me, if I'm not enjoying what I'm doing and if I'm not totally in, I'm not going to be doing it. Right. <laughs> well, and if you, I know that you probably read at the end of my bio, I always say, right, if it's not fun, I'm probably not doing it. Which to <laughs> exactly. me is not that, you know, I don't do things that are not fun. It means I have to try and make them fun to do them. There mm. are some things I just can't, like, I hate cleaning. I hate cleaning my house. I will do it if it's like, you know, somebody's coming over and I don't want them to see my house disgustingly dirty. Um, <laughs> but on a normal week, like during this whole stay at home stuff, I am mm -hmm. so thankful that my partner likes to clean because otherwise we would be living in a pigsty right now. There is <laughs> nothing, right? Other than the challenge with somebody coming to my house and me not wanting to be embarrassed that will on a normal day get me to clean. See, I use cleaning to not have to do what it is that I really should be doing. Procrastivity. To pro I procrastically. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I got to be and really wanting to avoid it. something to do that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so getting back to what you were talking about, even in an area, I mean, because I guess if I'm talking about hyperfocus, I'm talking about I'm already having fun. So if I'm already having fun, do I still need to be building these breaks in to say, no. I don't know, go that for a That kind of defeats the purpose. You're going to take a break to have fun when you're already having fun. Okay. That makes sense to me. Okay. So let's move on to what I really want to talk about. I want you to tell us about World Without ADHD. Oh my God. I couldn't wait for you to talk about it. So this. cool. I am so excited about this project. I'm doing this with Chris Mitchell, who I met at the International ADHD Conference this last fall. And I was not presenting I saw in the program that somebody was presenting on fun theory. I thought, <laughs> oh my God, somebody else is doing play. What the heck? And so I immediately texted her and said, you know, we've got to meet. And so we had lunch the very first day and we just, we've been in love with each other ever since then. <laughs> so she's fantastic. So she lives in Portland, Oregon, and I'm in Portland, Maine. And we decided that we were going to write a very, very thoughtful book on ADHD, which was getting a little in the weeds. You know, we started having fun, but then it started becoming work. And one day we began talking about doing a presentation on all of the amazing people who have ADHD and are famous in some way, whether they're scientists or, you know, economists, authors singers, artists, people who are alive now, people who are dead, but people who either have ADHD or hypothesized have ADHD. And Chris, I think, said at the end of our conversation, oh, we should end by saying, would you want to live in a world without ADHD? It was like this big pause. And we kept coming back to this and I just started having this big fantasy about all the things that we could do with just that concept. And so it eventually turned into this campaign that we're doing now around, would you want to live in a world without ADHD? We want to show people who are in the ADHD tribe, as well as everyone else in the world, how awesome ADHD is and how incredible the world is because of all the awesome things that people with ADHD have done. And we're hoping within the tribe, we think it's important because so many kids and adults who have ADHD at some point feel like they may not be successful because of the fact that they have ADHD. And 
you know, honestly, there are, there are challenges. We cannot deny that. And to different degrees with different people. But also when we honor the fact that we have ADHD and we pay attention to how our brains work best, we have opportunities for that playful hyper-focus where we can be incredibly insightful and creative and, of course, fun. So we want to help the ADHD community to improve their self-esteem by showing them all of this, but also by allowing them to show the world. So we're asking people in our tribe and people connected to them to submit artwork and written compositions to the project. We are going to choose a certain number of them to be printed in a book when the world gets back to being the way it was or, or the new way it's going to be. We're going to get those printed. We're also going to be showing off the visual art pieces online during the International ADHD Conference that's still happening in November. Finally, we're going to be taking the art pieces and we're going to be auctioning them off online to raise funds for the organizations that support our ADHD community. So it turned into a pretty big project. This is so awesome. I say this a lot, and I'm going to repeat myself, but when my son was diagnosed with ADHD, my husband and I didn't know anything about it, and I just could not believe he had ADHD because I knew just how brilliant he was. It right. didn't make sense to me. Of course, I didn't know anything about ADHD, right? I thought it meant that you were stupid. And so we hired this psychologist who was probably in her 60s, had decades of experience, supposedly specialized in ADHD, and she sat us down, thank God without him, I think it was our third session, and told us that our job as his parents was to reduce his expectations so that he wouldn't be disappointed later in life. She said he was too ambitious. Oh. And I remember thinking, okay, you're gone. You know, it was our third session. I already didn't like her. Good for you, but mom. When she, when she said that, I, I mean, I don't care if that was true. Would you ever say that to a never, child? Never, But then beyond that, she didn't know what the hell she was talking about. Oh. So anytime I see anything where we're trying to increase the awareness of the positive impact of ADHD on, on people, and then of course on society, I just love it. And about a year and a half ago, I created these two word clouds because I wanted to remember who all these incredible people were that had ADHD. And I printed them out and they just kind of hang on my wall. So every time I'm even a little bit frustrated, I go to that list. So what you're doing, I was on your website. In fact, I was on your website before I contacted you and said, I think you need to be on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Um, and that, that one section on your website where it's, I think it's like celebrities and cool people with yeah. ADHD and you go through actors and actresses, you go through artists. I didn't know Walt Disney. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. Athletes, authors, entrepreneurs. And I love that you put Peter Shankman in there. Yes, of course. <laughs> And entertainers, evil Knievel, like, duh, right? <laughs> but then the inventors, you know, like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, I think you have musicians there, yes. from Mozart to Elvis, you've got politicians, you've got scientists, and then you've got Tigger, Calvin, Bart Simpson, and Dennis the Menace. <laughs> Absolutely. I just think that any child, I, I'm not even thinking about the adults. I mean, sure, you know, the adults, I think it's important, but for the kids... Yeah. That they realize that this is something that they can, the sky's the limit. You know, they have not a disordered brain. They have a different brain. Yes. And once they learn what the manual is for their specific different brain, literally the sky's the limit. So I just love what you're doing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, just absolutely love it. Okay, so I am assuming if people want more information, they're going to go where? They're going to go to worldwithoutadhd.com, or they can look us up on social media, also under World Without ADHD. On Twitter, it's uh, the initials for World Without ADHD. Don't ask me to spell them out because I can't. My brain's not that fast right now. 
<laughs> I'm like, W, W, O. We'll have all of this in the show notes, by the way. So just go to the show notes if, you know, you're looking for these specific links. I want to emphasize anybody can participate in this. You don't have to have ADHD. Any age, one of our first submissions was from a girl eight years old. Her name is Daisy. Uh, There's a post up of her art already that's just incredible. Any writing, any visual, if you're doing something that's in three dimensions, like a sculpture or something like that, as long as you can take a picture. And while there are a lot of formatting issues that we've got on the website, just send it in for now. We don't care about the formatting and, and the pixels and all that right now. We'll get back to people about making sure we've got the right images when we come to printing the book. But just get them into us so we can start putting them up on the site and showing the world just how awesome this tribe is. You know, especially during this time of homeschooling, coronavirus, this is such a great thing for kids to get involved in. Yes. So please, Kirsten, remind me when your podcast goes live, remind me so that we can post in the group and maybe our group, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, we are, I don't know, I think close to 7,000 members strong, but I would love to put this out for kids to get involved in it, especially. Absolutely. So remind me because, you know, ADHD brain. Okay. <laughs> I tell you what, you remind me to remind you and I'll remind you, okay? Well, we'll remember. We'll remember. This is important. I'll give you 10 extra points if you remember without me reminding you. Oh, geez. That <laughs> damn challenge again. <laughs> you know that does work with me. In fact, my story is... I was trying to figure out what area of law to go into. And someone told me that securities law is the hardest oh, yeah. area of law. And when I heard that, guess what? All That's in. what I was interested in doing. Yep. So I went and got a master's in law in that after law school because someone planted that little seed. Okay. So I have two more questions before I let you go. Okay. What do you think the key to living successfully with ADHD is? And I know there's not one. I think it's learning to do it your own way. So I think so often we're looking outside of ourselves for the answers on how to make things easier, how to do things successfully, and we're given the way everybody else does it. And when we try and do it that way, we just can't sustain. And so recognizing how you do things, what gets you going, and also allowing yourself to change it up. You don't have to do things the same way every time. I love that. I love that. And to have fun doing it. Fun. Of course. <laughs> of course, fun. Okay. What are the, I'm, I lied. I'm going to ask you three questions. <laughs> I, what are the ADHD traits that you feel are responsible for your personal success? Ooh, well, hyper-focus always because, you know, without that, <laughs> what's the point of having ADHD? Or nothing. I don't know. <laughs> um, and I think also being engaged by play is actually an ADHD trait. And so, you know, I think that that makes me a better parent. I think it makes me a better problem solver. Um, and it, it just makes me more fun. So um, those are the two, you know. And I think also sometimes it's a hard question to answer because we're not the best observers of ourself. And so trying to figure out like, what really works for me? How do, how do these traits come out in ways that are sparkly? Um, Yeah. Asking my partner ahead of time would have been a good one, but. (laughs) (laughs) I think that whole play fun thing too, the dynamic there, what I have realized is most people with ADHD are really funny. They have a really good sense of humor. And that is one of my non-negotiables. If you can't laugh, if you don't have a sense of humor, I don't want to be your friend. Yes. Which is why I think I gravitate towards other, you know, people. They're they're my tribe that, you know, people that have ADHD because they do have that sense of humor. They're funny and kind of irreverent. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. (laughs) I think without humor, people have too much drama. So humor is true. Yep. True. Okay. Last question. And then I'm going to let you go. Okay. How about giving us one or two ADHD workarounds? What are the things that just really, like you rely on them every day? Like for me, I've got to exercise first thing in the morning because medication doesn't work for me. Um, 
diet is huge for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I went on a paleo diet mm, probably about 11 years ago for other reasons and realized that when I took out the sugar and the refined, you know, the grains and um, all the, the garbage food so many of us eat, that my sleep got better, my, my thinking got better, my attention got better, my memory got better. So I think that diet is huge for so many things, but especially for me, for ADHD. Yeah, no, I, I would 100%, you know, agree with that. If, if I'm eating crap, I feel like crap, my brain's all foggy. Yeah, I completely agree. You are what you eat. There you go. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and I will say that when I was exercising regularly, that was huge for me too. Unfortunately, I had some health stuff that happened in the last couple of years and I fell off the bandwagon and I am trying desperately to get back on it. Um, it's difficult because my partner has health issues and he's so skinny anyway, so... He, you know, exercising isn't a huge priority for him, but I miss having that accountability partner that I used to work out with. So I'm looking forward to getting back to that this year. Yeah. That sounds good. That sounds great. So Kirsten, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. As I said, we're going to put all your links in the show notes. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just so excited about this uh, World Without ADHD project. Did I get the name right? You did. You got the name of the project right. And you've gotten my name right. Yay! Woo! Yay! <laughs> okay. So that's what I have for you for this week. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. If you like this episode with Kirsten, please let us know by leaving us a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn just how their ADHD brains work so that they too can discover their amazing strengths. And your reviews, they really help in that regard. Remember, they're like those little gold stars that we used to get on our work when we were kids in school. One more thing, if you have a comment a guest you'd like me to interview, or a topic idea for this podcast, you can go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com and leave me an audio message or reach out to me at tracy at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you liked what you heard, we sure would appreciate a review. And not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, well, that's also the name of our free Facebook group. Go look it up. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. We'd love to have you join us. You can also find all my details over at tracyoutsuka.com. Don't forget, I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.